we are going to be moving on to our next presentation, which is by Dr. G James Keach, and it's titled Breeding Taro and Sweet Potatoes, Tasty and Beautiful. Um, James Keach is the Assistant Extension Agent for Ornamental Crops, and he is the Master Gardener Coordinator for the University of Hawaii at Manoa College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources in the county of Kauai. His background is in plant breeding and he has worked with a range of ornamental and edible crops. When he was based in Hilo, he led the breeding programs for taro and sweet potato improvement. Prior to moving back to Hawaii, he worked in a public garden, garden in Singapore, conducting research and outreach on orchids and other flowers. His PhD work focused on screening species for impatience for resistance to downy mildew and breeding this into commercial nursery varieties. In his current role, he hopes to expand the range of plants and new cultivars available to the ornamental community. Dr. Keach, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for that introduction. Aloha kako. You're welcome. I'll share my screen here and then we can get underway. So uh, as Glenn mentioned, I started out kind of moving back to Hawaii, working on taro and sweet potatoes. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that today, partially kind of giving y'all an update and background on my research, uh, more directed sort of towards an edible side, but then also discussing some possibilities in terms of what could be done with these uh, from an ornamental point of view. And, you know, this is all sort of as we work on transferring knowledge and uh, sunsetting some of the programs. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the ornamental market for both of these crops, since I think we typically think of both sweet potatoes and taro or kalo uh, edibles here. But on the mainland, you know, we, there certainly is consumption of both of them, probably a little bit more sweet potatoes than taro but they've become really, really popular as landscape plants. Uh, sweet potatoes now are a really popular filler. They're used in containers a lot to kind of fill in like that. And I actually had heard that one program uh, that's breeding new sweet potato varieties has said that their profits from their, sweet their ornamental sweet potatoes actually fund their edible sweet potato breeding, that the profit margin is that much better. Uh, chartreuse is definitely the most popular color by far. It has a really nice contrast, kind of like we see over here on the right. Uh, but there is interest in purple varieties as well, and I'll talk about those in a little bit, as well as some other color forms. Price point on these is really good. Uh, $13 for a single plant of the new Treasure Island series. Uh, this is one that Louisiana State just released. Its big appeal is that it produces an edible tuber as well as this attractive foliage, but still that's an incredible price point uh, for a landscape annual essentially. Uh, and both of these are typically considered annuals on the mainland. Uh, taro, uh, you typically will hear it referred to as elephant ears in a lot of landscaping on the mainland. People really like it because it gives a tropical feel and it's also useful in that it can be grown in wet areas. Uh, is sometimes as a water feature, sometimes just as areas that have water logging. Uh, the nice thing also is I think here we typically think of corn maturity and how that kind of feeds into growing season, but since there's only a focus on the foliage, it really kind of changes the game for propagation. And speaking of propagation, uh, this is a related species of taro, uh, Colocasia gigantea, uh, in the lower right-hand corner here. You can see huge, huge leaves what I found really interesting is while there's vegetative propagation going on, kind of like we're used to hearing about with taro, you know, huli and uh, keiki and all of that, there for uh, gigantia, they're actually using seed production. And I think this is really kind of interesting as we talk about taro breeding, taro setting seeds, you know, just something to kind of think about that we might be able to capitalize on a better climate than what they're dealing with. Uh, so Typically, I'll talk a little bit about kind of what we breed for looking at edibles. These are things that affect the, you know, the lower parts of the plant, the quorum or the root. Uh, so for taro, we see things like uh, rots, these, you know, that give that really nasty flavor if you cook and haven't cut all of that off, uh, but also things that are aesthetic uh, for the roots in things like sweet potato. So here we have uh, kind of this cracking typically caused by reniform nematodes doesn't change the flavor, but does kind of look unappealing. Same thing on the far right here, we see uh, taro, uh, 
sorry, rough sweet potato weevil, where it gets kind of these finger scrape marks. Again, doesn't change the flavor, just looks really unappealing. And then the insect here in the middle is the regular sweet potato weevil. This will make small pukas. Sometimes you'll only see one. Sometimes in a case like this, you'll see a lot. But even if there's only one, it triggers some defense compounds in the plant and makes it taste really nasty and bitter. You might have encountered this if you're buying them from the supermarket. I know I've made that mistake a few times. When we look at them for ornamental sake, there's some that kind of overlap with these plants as in their edible forms, but there's also some that are kind of a higher importance, uh, you know, thinking of a visual impact with these. On the far left here, we have two different types of teroviruses that are present in the island. Uh, top is Dachin mosaic virus, bottom is a terovane chlorosis virus. Both of these you can see kind of, you know, there's some appeal in that there's a nice color change, but they really sort of distort the leaves and kind of make them unattractive. Center is probably the most common disease of taro, it's taro leaf blight. You get these really ugly kind of dead patches, uh, ruins the leaf if you're using it for something like a luau leaf uh, or for lao lao. But you know, also for visual impact, it's really kind of unappealing. And because the leaf is affected, this actually decreases the amount of energy going to the roots. So this is something that edible growers really get concerned about as well. And sweet potatoes, looking over here on the right, this is something I see as kind of a burgeoning issue. And I you know, haven't looked too much into it beyond kind of Hawaii, but we're starting to see a lot of things with leaf miners uh, where they get into the leaves and they cause this kind of uh, necrosis. You can see in the bottom here, it almost looks like someone took a flamethrower to the plant and just toasted it. And this is a really common symptom. There does seem to be some resistance to this though. So it's something we could be working on, but something to keep aware as we're thinking about kind of ornamental aspects of sweet potatoes. Uh, I'll talk first about taro and kind of some of the history and some ideas with that. And then I'll go on to sweet potato and talk a, a little bit about that before getting to the end. Uh, so just as kind of general info, I think most folks here are probably familiar with taro or kalo in Olelo Hawaii, um, but it's native to Asia all the way down into India, uh, up into China and several parts of the Pacific. Uh, it's been spread throughout Polynesia. Um, in its native range is pollinated by fruit flies, not the ones we have here, uh, although we have so many, uh, but they, when they plants were brought over by native Hawaiians, they didn't bring the fruit fly pollinators. So the plants here typically won't set seed unless we manually pollinate them, which we'll talk about later. Uh, there's two main types in terms of edibles, uh, taro, kind of what we're used to seeing with these big corms that are diploid, and then smaller ones, kind of like what you'd see at maybe uh, kind of Chinese markets, uh, typically in Indian cuisine where they're called dashin, China it's called yuto. Uh, these are triploid, they tend to be a little bit uh, more tolerant of a range of climatic conditions, but as they are triploid, they're a little bit harder to breed with. And I wanted to say, you know, as this is something that kind of the university has messed up in the past, that these have an important role in Hawaiian culture, not just uh, for food, but for mythos and kind of for history as well. And so kind of keeping that in mind whenever we're doing work with taro. Uh, the university does have a history of breeding with taro. It started way back in the 1920s. I'm not gonna kind of go all the way back into that, uh, but I will talk about some of the more modern uh, work that's been going on, both ornamental and edible. Uh, so probably the most recent breeder whose work you might have seen was Eduardo Trujillo. Uh, he bred three new cultivars, uh, Paakala, Palehua, and then one other. These were noted for having these giant yields. You can see 20 pound corms like this uh, down at the bottom. Uh, unfortunately, there was some issue with him trying to patent them. Uh, these were bred for native Hawaiian varieties. And so they ended up kind of in a kerfuffle, which is beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, but you can find out more in this publication, Sitar and Taro. Uh, the next breeder kind of after him was Dr. John Cho. Uh, he was based over on Maui, and he had started breeding more from an edible point of view for Taro leaf blight resistance, but a visiting ornamental scientist noticed that he had these really attractive leaf forms, and so started talking to him about commercializing these. And he started his own company, which I'll uh, share in the next slide, this is him holding a variety he released called Black Coral. You can see really, really nice visual impact. Uh, one of the things though, kind of learning from some of the challenges of Trujillo's work 
is the university had asked him not to use native Hawaiian cultivars in his breeding program. So that although he's well known for his ornamentals, none of them have native Hawaiian varieties in the background, sort of sidestepping some of that issue. And then Susan Miyasaka and uh, Popo Bernabe, who is the breeder working under her, have kind of the most uh, modern program in terms of tarot breeding. This is what I was doing on Big Island, filling in for Susan while she was county administrator. And uh, this was geared mostly towards edible tarot, but we will, as I've talked about in a few slides, uh, encounter some ornamental types. And I think there's some real potential there. And as I mentioned, if you want to learn more about the history of CTAR's work with tarot, there's a free publication here at, at this link uh, that goes into some of the history, written from a CTAR perspective, of course. So I mentioned John Cho's breeding program. Uh, these are just a small handful of what he's released. It really has the whole scope in terms of color forms. I should clarify, these aren't under the auspices of the university. This is his private uh, breeding program. And then it's been licensed uh, by Plant Haven and a few other groups. Uh, Maui Gold though, you see that really nice kind of chartreuse here in a container planting with a millet in the background. A tropical storm that has this almost like variegation in the center that I'll talk about a little bit in the next slide. Uh, but again, showing kind of what a container plant can look like, since I think we're not used to seeing it like that. And then Hawaiian punch over here on the right, where you get this really beautiful contrast of the petioles and the veins compared to the leaf. This is in an in-ground planting. And he has ones that are kind of in this color range, but also ones that are sort of more purple. So it really kind of, thinking differently about a crop that we're used to seeing in a different role. Uh, there are other ornamentals out there uh, beyond the ones that John Cho has bred. A uh, mojito I've seen around in the islands pretty often. It has this nice kind of flecking on the leaves. A uh, pharaoh's mask is one that's relatively new to the market. This is, people keep asking me if it's a, a virus. I'm pretty sure it's just a simple mutation that causes this really deep kind of ribbing. You can see a really different visual impact from these leaves compared to what we're used to seeing with taro leaves. Uh, Nancy's Revenge is an older cultivar, but is the source of kind of this white in the center. John's bred that into a few different forms. The big issue with this is Nancy's Revenge has something called runners that I'll talk about in a few slides uh, that really make the plant kind of invasive if you're trying to grow it in a landscaping setting. And then I did want to just briefly mention there are other species of colocasia that uh, have different color and uh, sort of ornamental aspects that haven't been investigated as much from a breeding point of view. You know, could these be kind of folded in and again, have kind of that dual visual impact? Uh, so just to kind of give background in how we develop new tarot varieties, I think there's kind of a lot of mystery and we're kind of, we want to work to elucidate that just to kind of show what's going on. So tarot has two different stages of flower maturity. So on the far left, this is a female flower one day before maturity where it's kind of green, and then it turns yellow and gets fragrant uh, as it reaches female maturity. A day after that, it'll reach male maturity, it'll open up and you can see a little bit of powder in the background, that's the pollen. That typically will tap out and kind of save, and then we'll cut off the top of a female mature variety so that the pollen doesn't fall down in from that later on, open it up, dump the pollen from the one we want as the male in there, and then cover that. If we wait a month, we end up with a berry like at the upper left. This is filled with tons of seeds. Uh, I think there's been documentations of several thousand seeds in one berry. Uh, this is very different compared to what I mentioned with the Colocasia gigantea, where you get maybe 20 or 30 seeds. You can see these are pretty small. They're about the size of a sesame seed. Uh, we'll, clean these off, plant them in kind of community pots, almost like you do for orchids. You get these really cute little seedlings that we then pull out the best looking ones, the strongest, fastest growing, and plant them into kind of other plant uh, pots like this. Uh, once we get them to seedling stage, we put them out in the field. And across the bottom here, I have kind of different tarot seedlings. And these are all siblings. They're from the same cross. But you can see a huge range in terms of different heights, yeah, a little bit of different coloration, uh, some different leaf shapes. So, you know, just like human siblings, you end up with some real diversity. Uh, in edibles, we select for different traits. Uh, one, like opihi, you can see kind of these like huge chunks of the corn missing. This is where the keiki kind of cling too hard onto the mother corn. I mentioned runners with Nancy's Delight. Uh, this is in the middle 
slide here. So this is uh, where they start throwing stolons going out and it's sort of, the plants are great in that they spread, you know, it's great if you want to take up an area, not so great if you kind of want to control your planting either for edibles or for ornamentals. I will mention though in Filipino cuisine, these are actually eaten. And this is a photo of some that I found in a farmer's market uh, being sold to consume. And then we occasionally find other traits that are unexpected, but really interesting. On the far right here, we have a plant that came up in one of our fields. Corms weren't really exciting. Plant wasn't that unusual, except it seemed really attractive to the fruit flies we have on island. Uh, and this was on Big Island. It was covered with them. You could hear the buzzing from almost 100 feet away and had kind of an unusual fragrance. And there have been breeding programs in other parts of the Pacific breeding just for that fragrance. So, you know, other traits that we could be bringing in potentially adding value of, you know, ornamental, edible, and processing potentially, kind of like they do for lavender almost. Uh, the edible side of the breeding program, we've seen really good uh, work in terms of the yield improvement, showing something a little bit older here versus a newer variety on the right in the crates, you know, just huge differences in size. I'm just gonna play the short video uh, just to kind of show you, typically we'll cut open pterocorms with a knife, just like you would in the kitchen. We've started to get ones that are so big, we actually had to take a sawzall to them. And so just, you know, maybe not something practical for uh, commercial settings, but huge yield potential, just really exciting. We also, uh, in the edible breeding program, would make poi out of these. And you can see a huge range of variation here on the lower right in terms of color of poi. Everything come from kind of like raspberry, raspberry beret almost, all apologies to Prince, uh, to sort of a yellowish color that uh, some folks in Tahiti consider a, a higher quality poi. And then we'll do taste tests with these as well. I, I think there's all sorts of possibilities for bringing in new traits into taro from an ornamental point of view, as well as from an edible point of view. I mentioned giant taro, uh, Colocasia or Leucocasia gigantea, be really fun to kind of get these large leaf. Um, imagine what you could do for like making lao lao or luau leaf uh, with that, you know, and bringing that in. Uh, also, ape, which we see here is sometimes used in landscaping and in some uh, traditional plantings, but you know, not always thought of as something that we consume. But there have been hybrids documented between taro and ape and its close relatives. You can see it has a really nice kind of interesting flower typical sort of aeroid shape, but held up a lot better than we see from the taro flowers. Uh, also another alocasia, uh, conjavoy, we see has these really nice berries, very different looking from the taro berries. This is another one that's been documented as hybridizing with taro. So maybe we could get something like that where we have these really nice visual impacts uh, that you're seeing with other aeroids uh, being used for a cut as the flower and then as well as for the leaves. And then here on the right, you know, I mentioned we get some fun stuff coming out of the breeding program. This is one plant we found that had purple flowers instead of yellow or kind of a purple covering over the yellow. And so, you know, maybe we could even work within the tarot diversity that we have and kind of select for things like that. I think there's just a lot of opportunities, you know, with and kind of collaborating with the tarot work that's already been going on. So at this point, I'll switch over to sweet potato. I think I'm still doing okay time-wise. Um, and talk about that a little bit. I, so sweet potato is native to South America, but also has been found across the Pacific. So it looks like it's been spread there as well. Uh, it came to Hawaii as a canoe crop. And so it, there are several native Hawaiian cultivars and I'll mention some projects going on with that. Uh, it's an auto polyploid. So it's one ancestral species that got duplicated and ended up as a hexaploid, which just makes the breeding a little confusing. Uh, we typically think of them as orange flesh type or yam types, and these are a good source of vitamin A. The government actually has started giving uh, money to schools growing these as, you know, something that they can add for their school gardens that also is uh, nutritionally beneficial. But the purple type, like Okinawan, have become popularized uh, for their anthocyanins, and the Blue Zones Project, which uh, cites Okinawa as this area that has really high nutrient value, uh, seems to really uh, become popular. Uh, Dr. Oz has been touting this, and I think you know we can kind of work on it. And over here on the right, I have selections we've been making just within fields of Okinawa and you know, different forms that seem to be going out. 
uh, some mutations. You can see different shapes, uh, different colorations. And this is something that can be selected for darker purple, better shapes, just from mutations within the fields. I mentioned that you know there are some ornamental breeding programs out there that are really profitable. I think North Carolina State University's program run by Craig Yencho is probably the leader of the pack for now. They have the purple types like you see here with Bewitched After Midnight, really kind of nice contrast used in a container. And they've also bred for a kind of more controlled growth habit. As I mentioned, chartreuse ones have this really great visual impact used in containers sometimes to fill in, but also you can see here at the top, just really nice kind of on its own as a contrast, not necessarily filling in with it. And then in terms of other color forms, uh, we're starting to see some reds coming out. So at the bottom of the planter here on the right, you see sweetheart red. We have this kind of coppery, dark copper, I guess, foliage with these kind of new growths at this really nice contrast. I'll talk about another color form in a few slides. I've been trying to collect ornamental ones that are available in state. So far, I've found these two uh, on Kauai. Please hit me up if you know of any others in state. I'm trying to kind of put some collections into our field trials with the edibles. I put a question mark by the names for both of these because I've been doing the ID work, looking at photos online. So, you know, not always 100% reliable, but I think these are probably Goldfinger for the chartreuse one, which you can see great contrast here. And the right one with the unfortunate name of Blackie, uh, that has this kind of purple sheen and a little bit of green with the new growths. So when we were working for the edible sweet potato trials, we started looking in terms of sweet potato yield, uh, but also other characteristics. So we had ones like Regal up here at the top uh, where we're seeing three times the yield of Okinawan. Uh, this is a really happy growing plant, uh, but it does have some disease issues that crop up. It was also number one in our taste test though. Um, and on the top right here, we had some of the cubes from our taste test that we've done 18 different varieties. I think we're up to 40, 60 ones now. So it keeps kind of expanding. Uh, Sumor, a little bit below this, double the yield of Okinawan. Not as exciting visually, uh, still was in the top five of taste tests, but not you know as exciting. The interesting thing with this is it seems to actually inhibit the growth of reniform nematodes in the field. And we haven't seen this trait too much in other sweet potatoes. There's a few native Hawaiian varieties that do the same thing, but we're trying to pursue this as maybe something to help control reniform nematodes that cause that really unfortunate cracking. And the bottom right here, just to show you kind of how different the different varieties look in the field in terms of uh, foliage diversity, things that we could be selecting on from an ornamental point of view. Uh, we do, our breeding work, kind of like we do with the taro, we start seedlings and you see up here on the upper left, these are what sweet potatoes look like when they're grown from true seed. They get that kind of V-shaped or uh, live long and prosper kind of thing going on with the cotyledons. And then the new leaves have uh, kind of the shape of what the parent of the adult plant will look like, in this case, kind of a heart shape. Along the bottom here, I wanna show these are different seedlings. We planted one plant of each. It's a little hard to see with the bags, but you see some difference in terms of uh, flesh color, but also the number of tubers in the bag. And these are from one plant, everything from just one all the way to, I think we had about 12 in, from one plant. So really different yields as well as shape and color. And then I mentioned before that there are mutations. And so we've been doing some work selecting those. Uh, we put some into tissue culture recently that seem to have darker purple flesh within Okinawan. But we also see negative mutations where we see ones where the flesh is all turning white, uh, kind of like the streaking here. Not something we want, but something to just kind of stay on top of. Uh, other groups at the university are also working on sweet potato, and I just wanted to kind of give them a shout out. Mikey Kantar has been working with Ted Radovich and some other folks on native Hawaiian cultivars and some ones developed from them reading the genetics of these to kind of see where the plants have come from, uh, kind of tracing their history, which I think is a really interesting study, but also looking at uh, consumer acceptance of these. And he had a master's student, uh, Todd Anderson, over here on the right, who just graduated uh, doing this work. And Todd's holding two jumbos that had come out of their program. Uh, Noah Lincoln has also uh, done some work with this. Uh, his, he's an indigenous cropping systems professor, but has also done some work with ethnography. 
his student over here on the right, William Sarabis, is looking at indigenous cropping systems uh, from Papua New Guinea, where he's from, but then also looking at uh, different sorts of management styles. So you can see kind of mounding here at the bottom and how that affects growth, as well as different cultivars from different parts of the Pacific. Uh, if you're interested, William's going to be defending his uh, master's a week from now, almost, a, well, I guess an hour before this time. Uh, you can either reach out to me or to the Department of Tropical Plant and Soil Sciences for information about that. Uh, talking about future sweet potato breeding, you know, as I mentioned, I'm kind of trying to move out of the edible side of it, but I think there's some interesting things that could be done. Uh, we found some varieties that have both purple and orange flesh. So you're getting that vitamin A benefit, but you're also getting that anthocyanin. Can we bring that in? Uh, we also see some real differences in terms of flower production. Up here at the top left, you see some really nice, you know, flowering, sort of more compact growth habit. Is this something that would be interesting to people? I don't know, you know, it might be worth investigating. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of variation in the flowers, but I've been keeping an eye out for that too. And then on the right here, this is a different color form, and I haven't seen a lot of work beyond this cultivar called tricolor. The interesting thing about this is looking at some of the history, uh, it looks like this was actually developed from Okinawan. Okinawan has a recessive gene that if you pollinate it with itself or with other uh, kind of related plants, you end up with this kind of really nice variegation that has kind of that pink cast to it. And I think, you know, with considering how well Okinawan does here, uh, we might be able to kind of pursue this and use this as something that we could really kind of create a local market and have an edge on. Uh, with that, I wanted to just give a shout out for a publication we're about to put out called How to Breed Your Own Taro. Uh, we've submitted this to the Office of Communication Services and they're helping us with the formatting and just updating some stuff. This is something trying to demystify the process and really empower people in this rather than kind of keeping the power in the hands of the university. Uh, it talks step-by-step step how to breed tarot, but also talks about the responsibility that comes with that in terms of not just releasing these plants without names, not having them kind of replace uh, native Hawaiian varieties and things to select for like, you know, less runners and some ideas about that. Uh, so keep an eye for that. Hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have that out. Uh, with that, I wanted to thank our, some of our different funding sources, uh, HEOA, Hawaii County Department of Research and Development. Thank you, Glenn, uh, for handling some of that. Uh, the USDA's Hatch Act, and then a whole bunch of folks who've made this research possible. Uh, students across the board, the Waiakea station, uh, Research Station crew on Big Island when I was over there, and then the Wailua Station crew over here on Kauai. Uh, Susan Miyasaka had started this work, and I'm I know she's inching towards retirement, so we're trying to kind of transfer some of that over. Rashan Manandar has taken over a lot of the sweet potato work on island here on Kauai. And then Emily Kirk has taken over a lot of the taro work, uh, not as much with the breeding, but more kind of trialing in both of these cases. So we're hoping to really kind of breathe some new life into this. With that, I Thank think you, I'm almost at the end. And yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, just some fun photos I found of t-shirts and uh, and sweet potatoes online. Uh, James, we have one quick question for you. Uh, mm. Is it difficult to import sweet potato to Hawaii? Yes. Well, I should say, first of all, this should always be done legally, you know, making sure you declare it. Uh, it's a little bit easier to import the plants than it is to import the tubers. I have seen ones imported from the mainland uh, that are sprouting, so not irradiated. Uh, but I would say if you're planning on doing this, go through the proper channels, reach out to HGOA, reach out to me, and I can put you in touch with folks. Um, but you want to make sure you're not introducing another pest. We have enough pests here, you know, make, make our lives easier. But yeah, it is possible to do. Thank you, Dr. Speech.